This is Mike Sylvia with New Bedford Guide. I'm here at the Zytiern Theater with Kenny Barron, the famous jazz pianist, and Neil Weiss of Wellen City Sound, who is a sponsor of tonight's sold out show at the Z tonight at 7.30 p.m. It's sold out, so you're out of luck, so we're here to get some live stuff to, for those who are gonna miss out. Um, so Neil, do you wanna kinda guide us through some of the information? Uh, yeah, this is Stage Door Live that the Z is putting on. This is a series about once a month where they bring a, an amazing artist in and give you the chance to sit up close. Uh, so this sold out a few months ago, and I would say we could have sold at least twice as many tickets. Kenny Barron has probably 40 to 50 CDs under his own name, and I don't know, 1,000? No, well, not man. thousands. I th well, thousands. Hundreds. <laughs> Hundreds uh, as a side person for, I won't say how many years, because he's still a very young man, but it's in the, measured in the decades, and uh, uh, revered is not an exaggeration. So Kenny, can you tell me what is jazz and is there segments of it, is it broken down? How would you describe your jazz? Uh, well, is this, that's a big question. <laughs> what is jazz? I mean, it's, it's very difficult to go into that without doing a whole history. But I, I won't do a whole history. But basically, it's, it's a, a part of what was called the African continuum. So music that started in Africa, continued up through New Orleans, Chicago, New York. Uh, um, and the, the rhythms are African, some of the instruments are European. Harmony is European. So it's a fusion of all of that. You know, and uh, it's, it's about improvisation as well. Uh, you, you can't have jazz without improvisation. Uh, uh, so it's like um, using the structure of a song to improvise. It's not just playing any whatever comes into your head. It's using definite chord structures to, uh, to improvise upon. Uh, classical musicians did that with figure, something called figured bass. Uh, Bach and Haydn, Mozart, they were, they were improvisers. And that's what they used, figured bass. And they improvised in the style of the day, obviously. Well, Mr. Barron, you're sitting at a piano. Could you give us an example of what you're talking about? <laughs> well, let's see. <laughs> well, I will improvise, for instance, using, uh, well, I can't show you, but just chord symbols, uh, C7 to A7s, things like that, you know. Now, uh, and it all, a lot of it is visual, so you would have to see what figured bass looks like. It's Roman numerals. Uh, basically, which indicates the, 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 the number, the note of the chord. So a two and then say six, three, that would indicate the harmony, uh, the root or the third and the sixth of the chord. And of course the improvisation, would, and in that style, most of the chords, I was, they didn't have the same sort of harmony that, that's available now. It was basically triads, but inverted triads. So what would you say some of your um, inspirations came from when you first got into it? What got you into jazz? Uh, well, I started listening to jazz, I guess, wow, very early. I was about 10, uh, which wasn't unusual at the time. You know, uh, uh, I had an older brother uh, who was also a jazz musician, he played tenor saxophone, named uh, Bill Barron. He had a collection of 78 recordings uh, that I would listen to. And also, uh, you know, uh, people like uh, Dexter Gordon and Charlie Parker and Fats Navarro, people like that. And uh, also Philadelphia had a fantastic 24-hour jazz station on the radio, you know. So between listening to my brother's recordings and listening to the uh, radio, the jazz station, it was, uh, you know, there was a lot for me to listen to. So let's get some people out there listening to jazz. So obviously you have plenty of records out there. What are some people out there you recommend that they should listen to besides you? Besides me? Well, I don't know. <laughs> oh, but there's, I mean, there's uh, so much, you know. There's uh, from very early stuff, uh, uh, 
like James P. Johnson, on up to the, the young people today, like Gerald Clayton, uh, uh, Aaron Parks. You know, there's there's a, a whole uh, a whole bunch of music out there, and it's all good. It's all very very good. You talked about some of the classical musicians like Mozart and those kind of guys. Those are very influential to people out there too, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. They are. Um, uh, in terms of harmony, though, it was uh, if you listen to like people like Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea, and, uh, it was French Impressionism, like uh, uh, Debussy, uh, um, Eric, Sat Eric uh, Satie had a big influence on, on the jazz musicians of today, harmonically speaking. So it's your first time in New Bedford? Um, no, it's not actually. No, he was here at For the Narrows, a show at the Narrows exactly one year ago with a trio. Uh, the leader is, it was a young drummer named Jerry Gibbs, uh, and the bass player that night was Ron Carter. And that trio did three CDs on the Wailing City Sound label, and every one of them went to number one on the radio mm -hmm. jazz charts. The first one for six weeks, the second one for seven weeks, and the third one for only two weeks. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I say is we were kicked out of number one by Kenny Barron in a duo CD with uh, Dave Holland. I was worried about it. I, I actually picked it up in Europe, and I thought, uh-oh, this is trouble, because it's, uh, my wife calls it competitive music. We, we're aiming for positions on the chart. So in that week, Kenny Barron had the number one CD in the country, number two CD in the country, and he had a third one where he was a side uh, side player on uh, uh, Jimmy Green's. Uh, oh yeah. A, a, what, a wonderful life. A wonderful beautiful, life. Yeah. A beautiful life. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, th three in the top ten, including number one and number two. Uh, remarkable feat. He at the same time he had uh, the cover of several of the jazz magazines and articles. And, hmm. So, Neil, you did good research. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to. I just, you know, the thing comes in the mail and it's the cover. <laughs> so, obviously, um, you're the sponsor tonight, so it's something important to you to bring someone like, a name like this to New Bedford, right? Uh, it is. It's beyond important. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing thrill. It's, uh, it's big for the community. And I can tell you the audience, uh, the, the people who will be on the stage tonight, will all be beside themselves. I don't think anyone will be here by accident or because uh, I, in, in some notes on one of the CDs I wrote something about people are fortunate if they happen to live somewhere near where he's performing. And that's how I feel tonight, that, that we happen to live somewhere uh, near where Kenny Barron is in town. Uh, no, thank I, you. I, I have one question for you, just to give your audience a sense of uh, what the life is like, the jazz mm. life. Could you give us the last two weeks and the next two weeks geographically, where, you're, where you were <laughs> and where you're going to be? Well, let's see. I started off in uh, San Diego, and we rented a car, and we drove up to Los Angeles and then Santa Barbara, and then uh, caught a plane to San Francisco, and I played in San Francisco uh, at the uh, SF Jazz Center for uh, about four, five nights, five nights, and uh, and then from there we played in Santa Cruz, California, a little short drive down the coast, and then we got a plane at four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, to go to Boise, Idaho, and I came in from Boise, Idaho last night, uh, or late afternoon, and uh, slept about four hours, and got up at four o'clock to come here. <laughs> My flight was at. Uh, Actually, my flight was at 11, so that wasn't too bad. Uh, a 10, 10, yeah. 10. 10, nope. yeah, flight was at 10. So what's, what's next for you after here, after New Bedford? Uh, um, well, we're playing uh, uh, this weekend at the Regatta Bar in, in, in uh, Cambridge. And then we'll go, the trio, we will go to Kalamazoo, Michigan, perform there for uh, a night. And then uh, the following Tuesday, the Tuesday, we will open at uh, the Jazz Standard in New York for a week. And then we'll be off for about two or three weeks, maybe. And then I go to Europe to perform uh, some duos with a, a fantastic pianist named Dato Moroni in Italy. Yeah, so it's, it's a, a full plate, but I dare not complain. <laughs>
So travel and lifestyle is in your future, and uh, is it you have a long tour? Is it going to be over soon? Or? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's in and out. It's endless. <laughs> yeah, it's in Continuous? and out. Continuous? Yeah, you know, so uh, it's been very unusually busy this year. You know, I spent the whole, almost the entire month of March in uh, Europe traveling, so that's, that can be a little trying sometimes, but uh, it was still fun. I have a question for you. Can mm -hmm. very, very, very few jazz musicians play solo, and those who do, uh, I would say, are few guitar players, but mostly piano players. But even among the piano players, I'd say it's one in a hundred who can do what you're doing tonight. Can you talk about a little bit about the challenges or the delights or whatever of being uh, playing, playing solo? solo piano and what you have to do to compensate for no drummer and bass player? And yeah. Sometimes you don't do anything. Sometimes you try and do everything. It's a, it's a balancing act. You don't want to overplay. You know, sometimes you you know, tend to be too busy uh, trying to compensate for the fact that you I've don't... I've never heard that in your music. Oh, yeah. <laughs> trying to overcompensate for the fact that you don't have a bass player or a drummer. Uh, and I will tell you that playing solo piano is, is for me, pretty scary. You know, uh, because you're, you're alone. You know? Um, and I'm used to playing with the rhythm section, so... Uh, it's a challenge for me. It's, it's definitely a challenge to try and figure out what am I going to play, what am I going to do, and I'm not the kind of person who likes to pre-plan things. I don't want to make a, make up a set list, for instance, before I come on stage. I want to see what the audience looks like. Looks <laughs> like, and uh oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, try and read the audience first, and then I'll figure out what I want to start with. So Mary Murphy asked, um, this is awesome. I hope Mr. Barron can come back again sometime so I have a chance to go. Can you come back and visit us again after this? Certainly. All you have to do is ask. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll get him back here. Huh? <laughs> Anything else you want to add, Neil? Um, I, I, I agree with the sentiment. It's, it's too bad. Uh, uh, whether we could put 1,200 people in here, uh, that I don't know, but I also don't think it would be, as you say, the ambiance of the stage and being this close. And so we'll have to figure that out, but we'd love to do it again. And just again, what a thrill it is, and I think the audience will bear that out tonight. If you get a chance to talk to anyone who made it tonight, uh, get their opinion, I would say. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, thanks to the city for allowing us, and the Z, for allowing us to do something on this scale. You know, it's both both tiny and huge. It's a wonderful thing. Okay, so I was with Kenny Barron and Neil Weiss from Welland City Sound, and have a great show tonight. Thank and you very uh, much. Thank you, and thank you for doing this. Thanks for your contribution to spreading the word. Thank you.